Hi guys, welcome back to Anesthesia. Today we're doing a whistle stop tour of airway devices. Obviously a huge part of our job and skill set as an anesthetist lies in airway manipulation. So there's no way we could really make much of a dent in this topic in five minutes, but here are the basics. Firstly, we'll look at airway adjuncts. These are the devices you can use to help ventilate your patient temporarily. Then we'll look at supraglottic devices. These are great for many types of elective surgery, but also have a role in the emergency setting as a temporizing measure. And finally, we'll look at endotracheal tubes and laryngoscopes. The only definitive airway is an endotracheal tube with a cuff inflated below the level of the vocal cords. But there are loads of types of tubes and also quite a few different ways of getting them in. So first up, nasopharyngeal airways. These are passed through the nostril into the posterior pharynx. When you do this, you must slide the tube posterior cordially along the nasal floor. So not careful adding up into the brain, or you could cause some serious damage. It actually doesn't stimulate the gag reflex, so this is a great choice for semi-conscious patients who won't tolerate an oropharyngeal airway. A nasopharyngeal airway consists of a soft plastic tubing with a flange at the proximal end to prevent inadvertent loss of the device into the patient's airway. That would be highly inconvenient. There are various ways to size the nasopharyngeal airway. Some people advocate sizing the width of the tube to the width of the patient's finger or just sizing it directly to the nostril. Importantly, NP airways are absolutely contraindicated in basal skull fractures or suspected basal skull fractures, facial trauma and nasal or oropharyngeal trauma. In these instances, there is a risk that the NP airway could breach the brain. Next is the oropharyngeal airway, also known as the GADAL. These are really useful and you'll probably use them loads in your career. They're passed through the mouth into the posterior pharynx to prevent the tongue from covering the epiglottis. So really helpful for bag valve mask ventilating a patient who keeps obstructing. You size these by measuring from the angle of the mandible to the incisors. Top tip though is usually green for women, orange for men and red for large men. Gidels do however stimulate a gag reflex so may not be tolerated well by semi-conscious patients and nasal pharyngeal airway might be a better choice for that cohort. So now we come on to supraglottic devices. These have revolutionised anaesthesia over the last few decades. As the name suggests, the fact that they remain above the level of the cords means there's no need to instrument the airway and usually patients can remain unparalysed, meaning faster theatre list turnover. There are two generations of supraglottic airway device. So let's look at the first generation. An example of a first generation device is the classical laryngeal mask airway, and that's inserted blindly through the mouth into the hypopharynx. The mask is inflated so as to create a seal against the laryngeal inlet. In operative settings, it's indicated for cases of short duration, so less than three hours, in patients who are fasted and at low risk of aspiration. It can also be used in emergency settings as a temporary airway bridging device in preparation for intubation, but nowadays a second generation device is recommended as first line in this instance. Their use is contraindicated if you need to use high peak airway pressures for any reason, in the presence of pharyngeal pathology, if there's significant risk of aspiration, or if there's an obstruction below the larynx. These are all instances when a definitive airway is needed. A variation on the classic LMA is the flexible LMA, which is armoured with a metal wire coil embedded in its wall, and that maintains the lumen patency even when it's bent. And this makes it very useful for certain shared airway cases when the surgeon may need to manipulate the tube to gain access to the surgical site. Now we come on to second generation. These are supraglottic devices that have features inbuilt that aim to reduce the risk of aspiration in the event of regurgitation. There are lots of these, so we'll just look at a couple of them. Firstly, the eye gel. In this instance, the laryngeal mask here is not an inflatable cuff, but it is a thermoplastic elastomer that molds to the patient's airway to generate a seal, generally up to 26 to 30 centimeters of water, which is a little higher than the classical LMA. It has an integral bite block, so if the patient bites down on the tube, you should still be able to ventilate them. There's a narrow borosophageal drain tube, which is reported to provide an earlier indicator of regurgitation and also to provide protection from aspiration. The airway tube is wide bore and short, reducing resistance to airway flow, and you can also pass a scope down it uh, or an airway exchange device. The eye gel is sized according to the patient's weight. Each device has the weight bracket they're designed for printed on them, so you can always check if you're not sure. Generally, you can ventilate most adults on a size four, which is green, but a lot of men will need a size five, which is orange. 
Now the LMA Supreme is one of many similar devices that your hospital may use. This is just a device that we used a lot in the first hospital I trained in, so that's why I've picked it. The mask here does have a cuff. It's inflated via a spring-loaded valve and pilot balloon, but this generates two seals, an oropharyngeal seal and an esophageal seal. And this is designed to reduce the risk of gastric insufflation. You can't see them here, but within the mask, there are aperture fins, and these reduce the risk of the epiglottis occluding the mask. Like we saw with the eye gel, there's a gastric drain tube, but this is larger in the Supreme. Again, there is an integral bite block, but in the Supreme's case, the stem is rigid and preformed. It won't mold to the airway in the same way as the eye gel. Now we come to the endotracheal tubes. I'm going to leave the cuffed versus uncuffed debate out of this and just focus on cuffed tubes because these are the ones that will give us our definitive protective airway. So let's first look at the basic standard ET tube. Starting at the distal end, we have a standard 15 millimeter universal connector to connect to the breathing circuit. We have the transparent PVC tubing. Uh, so polyvinyl chloride is a thermoplastic and so it will mold to the patient's airway when it's warm. It's also non-irritant and unlike rubber, doesn't degrade in the presence of lubricants, anaesthetics and antiseptics. There's a pilot balloon with a spring-loaded one-way valve, and this is what we use to inflate our cuff below the cords. Now this cuff here is a high volume, low pressure cuff. The cuff pressure should be lower than the tracheal capillary perfusion pressure, so as to avoid ischemia and necrosis. Low volume, high pressure cuffs now have largely been phased out because the pressure they exert on the trachea may exceed the capillary perfusion pressure and cause mucosal injury. The internal diameter of the tube is also labelled on it. There are formulae for calculating the correct size for paediatric cases, but generally in theatre for adults, a 7 is appropriate for women and a 7.5 for men. We could talk about this for a long time, but we're not going to. And then we have a marking here called the glottis line. And that line demarcates the level at which the tube should be advanced so as for the line to be level with the vocal cords. We also have a little hole in the side of the tube here called a Murphy eye. This window should enable ventilation in the event that the end of the tube abuts the carina. The tip here is beveled to facilitate passing through the cords and this bevel is always facing left because the tube is passed right-handed. Now I'll also just mention a reinforced or armoured ET tube looks very similar to this, but again, like the flexible LMA, has a metal wire coil embedded into it to keep the tube open even when it's bent. So it's very good for certain airway cases. Just beware though, if the patient bites on the tube, the coil will kink and the tube may not return to full patency. The south facing ring air Elwin tube is really useful for orofacial surgery. And this just improves surgical access with this little bend here. This just means that the external part of the tube can be taped to the patient's chin and the breathing circuit then hugs close to the patient's body out of the way of the surgeon. The downside to this is that the depth of its insertion is largely determined by its preformed bend. Now let's look at nasal tubes. You can pass a standard tube via the nose, provided the diameter fits through the nostril, but the connection with the breathing circuit can get in the way of the surgical access. So to overcome this, north facing ray tubes have a preformed bend so that the tube can be taped to the forehead and keep the breathing circuit connection out of the surgeon's way. They facilitate oral and facial surgery by bypassing the oral cavity to maximize surgical access. It's recommended to use a vasoconstricting nasal spray prior to attempting insertion to help open up the space as you're passing the tube past the turbinates. Because of the curvature at the back of the nasopharynx, even blindly inserting the tube has a good chance of ending up in the trachea but if you can, and some would say you must, use a laryngoscope, plus minus McGill's forceps to assist with this. Obviously these tubes have a smaller diameter than a standard tube, and this can lead to high peak airway pressures and produce an obstructed ventilatory pattern. You should also take special care, particularly in long cases, to protect the nostril from pressure sores and subsequent necrosis from the tube. Now a neural integrity monitor electromyogram tube, or NIM tube, is used for head and neck procedures where the laryngeal nerve is at risk of injury. You see just above the cuff here, there's a color-coded contact band, and this must be positioned between the vocal cords. This detects vocal cord movement if a laryngeal nerve is stimulated. The surgeons use a sterile contact probe, passing 0.5 to 2 milliamps of current, to test an anatomical site that they think could potentially be a laryngeal nerve. And if they have indeed found a laryngeal nerve, 
the motion of the vocal cords is detected by the contact band on the ET tube and the electrical signal is detected and displayed on the monitor with an audible click. I should also just mention that there are return electrodes that are placed over the patient's sternum, otherwise it won't work. So this tube essentially helps the surgeons identify and avoid injury to the laryngeal nerves. It is important though to remember that if the surgeon is relying on this technique, you must not use paralysis. Otherwise, even if the surgeon stimulates the nerve, there will be no, no movement of the cords and therefore no signal detected. So the surgeon will be falsely reassured and may well crack on and tear through the nerve. Now on to laryngoscopes. These aren't the only devices we use to intubate. We'll look at video laryngoscopy and fiber optic intubation separately. But let's look at the three key types of laryngoscopes that you really should be aware of. First, the MAC, probably the one you're most familiar with, right? This is generally the preferred laryngoscope for adult patients. It's a curved blade with a tongue spatula to move the tongue to the left to improve your view. It allows direct vision of the larynx by passing the tip of the blade into the vellacula in order to lift the epiglottis out of the view. Batteries are held within the handle and they power the light source via a fiber optic light path inside the blade. The handle shown here is a standard one, but this can be replaced with a stubby handle, which is shorter, hence the name. And this can be helpful in obstetric patients when actually passing the scope into the mouth can be tricky with enlarged breasts. There is also a hinge between the handle and blade which allow for more compact storage. And there are video laryngoscopic equivalents of the MAC blade too. So you have the usual feel of the direct laryngoscopy with the added advantage of a video screen showing the room what you're seeing. Now you may not use the McCoy now. It's largely been made obsolete by video laryngoscopy. It's a similar shape to the Macintosh in, in terms of its blade, but the blade comes in two parts connected by a hinge. And this lever mechanism flexes the tip of the blade in order to provide visualization of the larynx by moving the epiglottis more anteriorly. So the McCoy can be useful for more difficult intubations, like patients with an anterior larynx, but there is a risk of tissue injury if it gets caught in the hinge. And finally, the Miller laryngoscope. This is generally the preferred, this is generally the preferred blade for pediatric patients under two years of age. The fundamental difference here is that it's a straight blade and it's proportionally longer. It allows direct vision of the larynx by directly lifting the epiglottis itself out of the view. Children have a proportionally much larger and more floppy epiglottis, so actually picking up the epiglottis itself with the blade, not just inserting it into the vellacula, is really, really useful. Again, you can get video laryngoscopic versions of the Miller blade, but this is just the standard one pictured here. So there you have it, a whistle-stop tour of airway devices. Hope this has been useful, and if it has, why not like, share, and subscribe.